doing any racial math. It just sounds great. Everything's doing great. Good, good. So John, thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. I, I'm going to take that video home and show it to my wife tonight. To reintroduce it, re reintroduce it to the husband I thought she had. So, that was a great thing for you to do, and I appreciate it very much. I really want to thank the sponsors. You know, I have traveled the continent of Africa with Rotary. A lot of Rotary too don't know this, but Rotary, they do know this. Rotary is substantial or irresponsible for the most significant reduction in malaria that's ever taken place on the face of the earth in the, on the continent of Africa. And I've traveled with them to Benin, to Equatorial Guinea, to Rwanda, and other countries in Africa, promoting bed net programs for children and doing the things you have to do to keep uh, malaria from spreading people from dying from malaria. So to the Rotarians who are always serving Georgians and always serving this, their community, they're also serving humanity and mankind. What you're doing with the malaria program and other programs around the world are nothing short of fantastic. To the home builders, as a realtor myself, thank you for building all those homes that I got to sell once and twice and three times, because you only got to sell them once. <laughs> you built them and sold them and it was all past history for you. For me, I could sell it again over and over again if you'll move. Now it's a good thing for my wife. Good thing for my children, good thing for my creditors, and I still made some money to pay them, too. So thank you for doing that. To wrote to, uh, the, to uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Bernie, you are the best that there is in the state. And I say that in the room when you're there, I say when you're not there, and I say when some of you are other contemporaries are there. There's just nobody finer in Chamber of Commerce business in the state of Georgia, and probably the United States of America, than Bernie. She takes no credit, but she does the work. Colonel Short, I'm really glad that they contribute to you and your leadership in the base. But y'all left out one person. Y'all left out Parker Green. There wouldn't be no movie with him, Parker. He's a great individual, and his beautiful wife is here today. I got to give her a kiss a little earlier, which was one of the reasons I'm doing this one. We maybe get a kiss on the way out, too. <laughs> so Parker and Mark, Parker's a great advocate for Moody. I'll never forget when he came to Washington with the first crew that delivered the F 22s to the Pacific. I don't know whether y'all remember that crew or not. That was the crew that crossed the international day line and their entire electrical system of the airplane went out because the programmers and software forgot to account for the international day line. So those, that crew of that F-22, the most sophisticated airplane in the world, the most sophisticated plane in the world, flew it back to Hickam using celestial navigation because the computers didn't work. Which shows you in the end, you can't do it without the soldier, you can't do it without the pilot, you can't do it without the staff sergeant, you can't do it without the men and women in the military. We appreciate y'all very much. Thank you for what you do. I'm not going to take a long time, but y'all took some of my time, and I'm going to reclaim some of what you said on the floor and talk about three or four things you ought to know. First, I'm not here to, to brag about the Congress of the United States of America because there's nothing to brag about. This has been a very unusual year. It's been very frustrating. I've been in elected office for 38 years. I've been in Congress for 19. But I've never seen a year where we talked more and did less. And, it's, and the country is paying a price for it. Our men and women in uniform are paying a price for it today because our airplanes aren't ready to fly. Our training programs are not sufficient to keep enough pilots in the sea that we need to keep in the sea. We're, we're, not, we're short on everything. They're making it work. But when we have accidents like what happened in, in the Pacific with ships running into each other, when you have difficulties like Ospreys having trouble landing, when you have difficulties like helicopters, have enough helicopters that can make the grade. When you just don't have enough manpower and enough material to make your military do what you're asking it to do every single day, then you got a big problem. We've got to remember that right now, you and I stand here today in Dallas, Georgia. Many people from Moody Air Force Base are, sort of, are doing research and recovery at uh, Hurricane Harvey right now in Texas. The military is ready whenever you're If there's a problem, you don't dial 911, you dial Moody. And we're using them today to help save lives, and they're doing it right now as you and I stand here. But Congress has got to get its act together. Sequestration, which we put in place, is a bad idea that nobody would ever agree to pass. We passed it. And then we said, well, even though we passed it, nobody would ever agree to go to sequestration. Well, we did it. So basically, we've been sequestering by appropriating, appropriate, not evaluating. So programs in need of help haven't gotten it. And programs we should have gotten rid of are still in business. And when, when the colonel has to do a continuation budget for the military, I don't know what you call it in your rank, probably, I call it, but we'll have to do our budget on continuation. Continuation means we're going to continue doing all the things we did bad last year and add on to it. 
I'm for evaluation and accountability budgets where you look at what you did last year and you don't spend what you don't need to spend again. You invest the money you save in new programs and the manpower material and the system that you have to run for the country. If you don't do that, you're not doing your job. Every businessman and businesswoman in this room has done what I've done for years and years. My wife and I have 49 years with three grandchildren, three children and eight grandchildren. Every year at some point in time we sit around the kitchen table, figure out how much money I'm going to make, how much money we've got in the bank, what we want to do for our grandkids, what we've got to do to keep our house together. And we, we allocate expenditures, but we prioritize what we spend. We don't throw money away rather than give it to our grandchildren, we give it to our grandchildren. Don't throw money away rather than eat. We eat. The United States government is not evaluating how it's spending its money the way it should, and it's got to stop. And I'm a part of that. I'm not talking about the United States government as if it's somebody else other than me. I'm part of it. I'm telling you what I say on the speeches that I make on the floor of the Senate is equal as well, and did two weeks ago when we left. This is a year of accountability for Congress, and eventually we're going to be held accountable. Our next year's elections will be the most tumultuous in the history of the country, which is probably going to be anyway. But real quick, I want to talk about the priorities that are coming up. I want you to see a lot of on TV and what we're going to try and do in, in a brief, concise, but a hopefully important way of delivering it. One, taxes. Everybody's against taxes, but everybody's for those airplanes rescued people in Houston, right? Now. So you, you don't like paying them, but pretty sure glad you got the government and the, and the people to rescue you when you need it. Well, we're going to have to reform our tax code. The United States is one of only three countries in the world that doesn't have a territorial tax system. Most countries have a territorial system where they tax money where it's earned. If the Coca-Cola Company of India bottles a Coca-Cola in Delhi, India, and sells it in Mumbai, they pay an Indian income tax, and the Coca-Cola Company gets the reserve. Except if they bring it into the United States, they then have to pay taxes at the U.S. rate on the money that's made after they paid the tax at the Indian rate. They pay it twice as much. Our tax rate is 35% on C corporations like Coca Cola and UPS and people like that. Ireland is 12.5%. We're the highest tax corporate uh, government in the world. We're the most progressive tax corporate government in the world, and we've got to change that. The tax code needs to be revitalized, not to, not to pay less, but to invest more in our future. You know, all of us in business know that if you invest money in, in anticipation of return, you make a prudent investment, you do things you need to do to build the right product. You'll sell it, you'll make money, the people will enjoy it, and you'll prosper. But if you do nothing, you atrophy, you, atrophy, you don't make any money, and you don't produce, produce any business. So it's time Congress sent an incentive to all the business community. We're going to reform our tax code. We're going to tax competitively with the rest of the world. We're going to see to it America's still the best place to do business. We're not going to have a confiscatory tax rate. We're going to have a competitive tax rate that tells the business we're open for business. We want you to make the money and do it in business. In terms of the National Defense Authorization Act, which was mentioned a little bit earlier, that's up for reauthorization next week in Washington. Here we are, three weeks, by the time we get to it next week, there'll be three weeks left in the fiscal year. We've got troops deployed in all over the world, places you never heard of, places that a lot of people in this room can't tell you for security reasons. All over the world doing things you wouldn't imagine. And ever since I got elected to Congress, people always, somebody always comes up to me and says, hey, John, what's the most impressive thing you've learned in Congress of the United States. They expect me to come up with some great series. So the most impressive thing I've learned is you cannot imagine how every day how many things the United States military and our intelligence agencies stop. For every one tragedy that happens on this continent, like 9-11, 2001, there are countless hundreds of incidents that never happen. Because brave men and women that are in our military and our intelligence agencies and our government invest the money to see to it, you are as safe as we can be. Will there be another 9-11 property of some type? It's almost impossible to keep terrorism in the hall. But if you ever turn your back and say, we can't fight it, we can't stop it, then it'll be replaced. We have the greatest military in the world, the greatest security in the world, and the greatest intelligence in the world. We've got to do everything we can to make sure we give them the greatest investment in the world to see that that continues. Now, you, you shouldn't come out to your state after being a year in Washington and not talk about health care. Everybody, if I asked anybody what happened in Congress, they should say, well, John McCain killed health care. That's not really true. What killed the health care bill is a lot of us, self included, never got everybody around the room, held hands together, and said, let's jump off this cliff together rather than one at a time. We've been in this tit for tat debate in Washington where everybody's trying to win politically on the issue of your health care. Well, your mayor's here, he's a great mayor and runs a great job, and you can't run government like that. 
you got to sit around the table, you got to hold hands and cry. So I was trying to make the right, I always make the right decision. And I always pray it's the best decision for you politically. But don't make the best decision politically knowing it's not right for the community. Not addressing health care is wrong for this community and it's wrong for this country. I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, we're all Americans. Diseases don't have party labels. There are no donkeys and elephants in disease. Everybody gets sick. Everybody eventually is going to die, but you want to wait as long as you can to do that. You want a health care system to keep you alive. We have a health care law in America that we passed in 2009. It's just not working for the private sector, not working for the community, not working for the best interest of the health care for the American people. Government has a role in health care, but it's not the only role. The private sector has one too. And it's high time we listen to the physicians, the physician assistants, the researchers, and other people involved in health care. And reform our tax laws so there's more money invested in health insurance, there's more accessible health insurance to you. And we stop this problem we got right now, where next year, when January comes, in 96 of Georgia's 139 counties will be only one insurance company selling insurance. And after next year, there'll probably be none under the Obamacare law. In many states, that's going to be the truth next year as well. We've got to see through it that we reform the laws to bring back the private sector, that people participating in the economy, participating in, in providing insurance, and making sure health care insurance is accessible to you and to the best we can afford it. It's not going to be cheap. The most expensive thing you can have is no, no insurance and a dread disease. And we want to make sure if you ever do get a dread disease, God forbid, you've got insurance accessible to help you pay for it. So I'm going to be one of those that you're going to hear been hearing about next week that's formed a group where we're meeting four times in the next four weeks. See if we can't come up with a moderation of two positions between the Republicans and the Democrats. Come up with a platform to build a health care law that works for the 21st century, but most importantly, works for each of you. America's a great country. You'll never find anybody trying to break out of the United States of America. They're all trying to break in. Isn't that right? Why? Because there's no replacement. I had somebody tell me a few weeks ago, said, you know, if I ever vote for you again and you win, I'm going to move to all that Australia. I said, well, great, go ahead. What are you going to do in Australia? You're not going to do as much as you do in America. There's no place to go. No place to run. There's no place to hide. And America's hit. It's hit because of these home builders and these realtors. It's hit because of the Rose Brother International. It's hit because of the military men and women are here to protect us. It's hit because we all pay taxes and we invest in our country. We work hard to be better. We try to make America the best place we can for our children and our grandchildren. We gotta keep on doing it. If we ever abandon what is the great dream of all other people in the world, and that is America, our democracy, it'll never be recruited again. And we're at a time point in time where the issues are so big you can't look the other way. You can't hope somebody else will solve the problem. It's time for you to be a part of the solution. The US Chambers here, the Valdosta Chambers here, the Valdosta Home Goes, the Rotary Club, the Valdosta here, all of you here. We've all got to come to the table and do our part. This is politics and government is not a spectator sport. Our country's in trouble, our communities are in trouble, and worst of all, we're suffering what I, what I call a bad attitude. It's time we got a good attitude. It's time we finance our military like this should be financed, we tax the income like it ought to be taxed, we invest in business like it ought to be invested in, and we motivate the children coming out of school to go to work in America because it's the best place to go to work. It's got the best hope for their future, for the children they and their husband and wife raised. If we do that and that's our, idea, our attitude, we ain't gonna have no problem. But if we don't do it, there's no backup, there's no, no park green to save us. We're in it forever. So I urge all of you to keep doing what you're doing together. Come here together, builders, home builders, Rotarians, members of the Chamber of Commerce, realtors. Work together to solve the problems in your community. Work together to invest in your business. Work together to invest in your country. And remember this, it doesn't get any better than a place called America. And with that said, I'll take a question or two because they asked me to do that. I don't promise answers, but I promise I'll take your question. <laughs> Yes, sir. <coughs> I see a question back there. Me? Would you consider a single payer? Well, a single payer? Health care? I, I don't prefer single payer, no, because then I, I basically oversee a single payer system we're trying to diversify called VA health care. And that's something I know a little bit about because that's not why I'm responsible for Washington. So I would prefer a more competitive system where the, where the private sector and the government are working together to see to it that we have the type of programs available that encourage the private sector to invest in health insurance for the American people, give the American people a chance to buy the insurance that covers what they want. I think that's the best environment for that. And I ran a company for 33 years. The third largest, when I, when, I, when I went in business, I didn't even think about what it cost me to buy health insurance for my employees. 
My agents were all independent contractors. Under the law, you can't provide them with a benefit. But when you're employees like the secretary, you can't. So I, we, we did a benefit to come work and go pay your health care. When I left in 1999, it was the third largest expenditure in my country. Health care has grown exponentially, principally since 1968 when Medicaid had started. And I'm all for Medicaid. And I think we did a great thing in Medicaid. We provided services to people and health care to people who did, couldn't get any other way. But the problem is we never encouraged the cash investment in health care. This is a longer answer than you asked for, but you're going to get it whether you like it or not. <laughs> so the point the thing for us to remember is this. The government cannot always be the solution to say, let the government do it. You are the government. And eventually when the government runs out of your money, they run out of their money too. So we need a system where it's competitive. Business wants to go into it because they can make a dime, and you want them to go to it because you can go to work for them and help have health insurance for your family. So, no, ma'am, I'm not a I'm not a big supporter of a single payer system. I prefer to have a more competitive system that works. And I'm doing everything I can to see that we get that. Yes, sir. What's the real attitude among the public? Well, I'm not a mind reader. My wife does that well. But I don't I don't I don't do that at all. But. I'm not avoiding the question. I'm getting there, so it will take me a while. <laughs> trust, trust me. i got to meet with all the press after I give you the answers. So i got to be able to back it up when I get in there. That's the hard thing about this business. It looks easy if you got to go in there with them. And that's, that's another reason why we've got a free press. That's one reason we have a great country. You ever lose your free press, you ain't got a country. But uh, what was the question? <laughs> The overall, the over, there is not a single overall, the best answer to that is the right answer. There is not an overall attitude. There are individual targeted attitudes, and there are, they go from very bad to very good to I don't care. I would say the problem we've got is very bad is growing and very good is growing, and the I don't care is growing too. But people who do care and are not just going to play I don't care, or I don't want to, or not, are not going as fast as they should. President Trump is a unique individual. He, he, nobody ever thought somebody would come out of business, run for president with 17 other opponents in their primary and five in the Democratic primary, get the nomination, and then get elected and win the Electoral College and become president of the United States. Nobody thought that would happen. Well, it did happen. And our founding fathers thought about it happening. And they wrote a constitution that allowed this country to work regardless of what voters did. We set up a legislative branch like the House and Senate, Initial branch like our judges and the executive branch like the president to work it out. Our pains that we're going through right now are the pains of making the constitution, using the constitution to work for all of us. The president's got to depend on it. We have to depend on it, and the judicial system is going to have to realize the burden for calling balls and strikes, which is what the judicial system does, is bigger than it's ever been before. So I would say this: you have you have an individual who got elected president. Few people thought it would. He did it playing by the rules. A lot of, some people reject it, some people love it, a lot of people don't care one way or another, but one thing we all got to do is come together, executive and legislative, and both political parties, and make it work for the American people. We have a constitution that works, we have a system of government that works, we've just got to, the elected people in that government, make it work. That's the way I've always looked at it, and that's the way I look at it now. Got enough wiggle running in that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. What do you think the major part is the public getting anything done? Is it time for a change? Are you shifting Congress? Or what do you think you've done to stop talking but getting something done and getting back to thinking about it? I'm really glad you asked that question. I'm going to tell you something. There's a big movement called term limits. People want everybody to run just have two terms. They didn't solve the problem. They didn't solve anything. Let me tell you what term, what term limits do work. Term limits every, every first Tuesday in November, every year, every year. If you've got a representative who's not doing the job, you go vote against him and vote for somebody who is. Don't depend on some law that says you're going to serve two terms to get rid of the bad apples. You get rid of the good apples, too. You end up with the same old apples you had before, just with different names. The important thing to do is use your vote, use your rights as a citizen to participate in the process, use what the press loves, and that is an engaged electorate to, to call out your grievances and hold us accountable. And go to the polls and vote accordingly. If you do that, things will change in a heartbeat so fast you cannot imagine. Y'all been watching the town hall meetings on TV? Where people, you remember the movie Network where the guy raises the window and says, I'm mad as hell and I don't take it anymore? Well, a lot of people like that. 
I had, had, had a uh, town hall meeting Monday a week ago in Kennesaw, Georgia. Had a lot of people probably call me since they didn't know Jeffrey Kane was not an easy name for them to say. They, they called me a lot of different names, but they, they were holding me accountable. <laughs> and I called that town hall meeting on my own, advertised it in the newspaper. 1,100 people came, we only had 600 seats. I stood there in that, on that stage with a microphone and took questions for two hours and tried to answer them. When it was over, I felt good that I gave them the chance. Most of them appreciate the fact that I gave them a chance. We didn't solve any problem. We did open a dialogue. That's what we got to do in this country. We've got to open a dialogue between the elected officials in this country and the taxpayers and the citizens of America. And let's get to the heart of our problem, which is not good, which is we don't have good communication. We're always looking for somebody else to solve the problem. And we're now at the point where there's not a somebody else to do it. It's all up to us. We need to do it. I hope we can. But my answer to your question is, your involvement, your voting, you're putting in the right people in your community, everybody else doing the same thing, is the right solution. There's no other way to do it. The term loops doesn't work. You just arbitrarily sit and tell somebody they're going to only serve a few years. But if somebody told Santa Claus that you would only go three Christmases, that wouldn't work very well. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed that first part. I'll personalize it so that I can talk specifically about me. He said, well, what are, what are you going to do? We've elected you now. We can't get at you until November of next year. What are you going to do? Well, if I told you, I think the guys here from the VA would tell you this, we had a chance to get up. I've chaired the committee that's rewritten the VA laws in this country in the last two years to where we finally modernized the VA to match the soldiers of the 21st century. Reservists are not being paid equally when they go into combat like regular personnel. That wasn't true before. GI Bill, do you know the Guardsmen didn't, one of the military guard didn't have access to the GI Bill until two weeks ago. We finally passed the GI Bill for the military soldiers of the day, just like the one we passed in 1949 and 52 for the soldiers of World War II. So there are a lot of nitty gritty things we need to do in the government and the committees that are responsible in the Congress need to do it. And we need to be outspoken about the issues of the day. I'm on the front page of the Atlanta Constitution today taking the president to task. Or we're calling for a shutdown of government if we don't build a wall between us and Mexico. Now, I'm all for a wall. That's just fine. But you don't shut down the whole government. You cut off your Social Security tax, or your Social Security check, your child's health care, and everything else. It's good you to do what you want. What you do is you go to the table and say, hey, how can we find a way to do this? So I hope the president, the president will come back to the table and say, I'm not going to shut down the government. By God, I'm going to see if I'm going to shut down the Congress if it doesn't get to work. And then force us to go to the table. That's the way to handle it. The best way to do it is to get us back to the table work and negotiating across the aisle from one another. And if you don't like the end product of that 16, 18 months from now, and like somebody else, that is the best long term and the best short term solution. Thank you for having me. God bless all of you and God bless America.